Amen. Well, hey, you can have a seat. Hope you are uh, having fun this morning. Happy Father's Day once again. And we truly are here to worship our Heavenly Father, but celebrate dads. Um, I, as somebody was asking me earlier, oh man, are you going to preach in your, in your, with your hat on? And, and, and I, I, I thought, well, I could, but the whole time I was preaching, you know, last several weeks, uh, before last week, we were talking about winning the war in your mind because there's all these voices in our heads. Well, if I tried to preach with my hat on, I would have a voice in my head the entire time. And it would sound a lot like my mom <laughs> going, you can't, you, you can't do that. Now, hey, don't worry. If, you're perfectly fine if you're wearing a hat. I'm all good, right? But if I was up here doing that, I would just hear my mom in my head going like, come on, Ken, come on, Ken, you know. She would just bug me until I took it off. So I just figured I'd take it off at the beginning, right? Because <laughs> we have to respect, we, we got to respect those people in our lives, right? Um, and, and speaking of that, and of respect, um, for those of you who are, are seniors in the room, we have a seniors ministry that's kicking off, and um, we would love for you to come to luncheon on the 23rd. Um, if you would like to sign up, um, I know um, James Meek is in here, and Wayne Long, I think they're right back here. You can see those hands, and they would be happy to sign you up. Um, we love those folks, and we, we want you to get in, uh, included in on that. So we're in week two of this teaching series through the New Testament letter that was written to a church in a town called Colossae. So the letter's named Colossians, and it's written to them, and I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you don't, you can grab one off of the thing, and if you need one, take that one. It's yours. Um, Last week, we dove into the first 20 verses. Okay, we covered a lot of territory last week, and and we, we explained in no uncertain terms who Jesus really is. We focused on verses 15 to 20, and we found out this. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. He he created everything, and everything was created by him, and everything was created for him, including us. Okay, we we were created by him, we were created for him, and we were created to bring him glory. And when we do that, we're in touch with the purpose that we're created for, and we're going to get deep into that uh, today. So Jesus is God, and we said in him, all things hold together. How many of you had some things that kind of fell apart this week? Anybody? Anybody in the room had even just a little bit? Yeah, if you're a parent, you definitely had it, right? And things just get crazy. Things spin out of control. And and what we said last week is this. He holds everything together. You don't have to. And if you're constantly living in anxiety and worry, it's because you think you've got to hold it all together. And let me tell you that, that, that from the get-go, you won't be able to, you can hold a few things together here and there. You, you can avoid it, you can try to fix it, but, but God himself is the only one that truly can hold all of life together the way it's supposed to be held together. I don't know about you, I'm really good at putting Band-Aids on stuff. I, like I told you last week, I, I grew up and we, we were super blessed. We had a uh, you know, ranch in the family. I learned to fix everything with hammers, Duct tape, bailing wire, right? You put everything together. I'm really good at just band-aiding stuff. And a lot of us are really good at that in most areas of our life. But we don't fully get things fixed the way they're supposed to be because we fix it just enough to get by. And when we live that way, then our life is just constantly fixing one thing after another after another. And then you go for a little spell where you're thinking, oh, things are, things are looking good, and then something else falls apart, right? You guys all know what I mean? Or, okay, or you just really want a hot dog. Because <laughs> you're all looking at me like, oh, man, okay. So, but the whole idea is, that, is to, to live our life with great purpose. Um, and, and God holds all of this stuff together. So last, so last week we learned who Jesus really is. Today, we're going to look at verses 21 to 29, and we're going to help understand that in light of who Jesus is, who we are. So who are we when, it, when we stand in, in light of who Jesus is? And so what we've been doing just to kind of honor the text and respect that this is God's word, um, we've been standing as we read. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read verses 21 to 29 this morning. And so if you'll just... Um, Stand with me, I think the, the words will probably be up there as well. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this for us. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. 
without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become a servant, its servant, by means of the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works within me. Amen. So let me pray. Lord, thank you for this word. We thank you, Father, that you have something to teach us this morning. We pray your Holy Spirit will guide and direct us and help us learn what we need to learn this morning so we can be the people you want us to be and live the life you've designed us to live. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, have a seat. Thank you. Um, You know, war. War has been a part of the human condition from almost the very, very beginning. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I keep reminding myself, there, there are wars still going on in our world today, right? I mean, we have the war in Ukraine that just, you know, like we've, we've mentally, a lot of us have moved on. It's like you, you maybe even came this morning and you thought, oh yeah, I haven't even thought about that this week. B- but the war is still raging. And war has been raging almost from the very, very beginning. I mean, as soon as sin entered the world... It, it, with it came blame and anger and fighting, and, it be, and, and the evil one began to wor- do his work of trying to divide us, which he's still doing a pretty good job of, right? He keeps trying to divide us, because if he can divide and isolate us, then you know what we will actually do? We'll do his work for him. If he can isolate and divide us, then we'll just devour and destroy one another, right? And that, that's, that's what he's all about. And just a few chapters into the Bible, a few chapters into creation, murder, right? Murder, just because one guy gets upset with another guy, and they were brothers. And war and the anguish of death all entered the world and continued to ravage it. But we all, we all want peace. I mean, that, that, that's the thing that everybody longs for, right? We, we all want peace. We all want things to be how they're supposed to be. And we want to live at peace, but it seems so elusive in our world. Sometimes we just want peace in our homes. You know, I I know many of you are struggling right now, and you're just like, man, you know, it's just crazy. I've talked to parents lately who are like, man, finally, COVID seems to have like, it's not so bad, but now the kids are home from school, and it's just insane. And, and, And people are just like, oh, this whole thing is just so, so crazy, but we long for peace. Um, even people try to work out peace. Um, that's why we have these things called treaties, right? We have treaties so that we can kind of agree that we should try to get along and we should try to have peace. And I did a little research on this. The earliest um, treaty that we have known to man uh, comes from about 1350 BC when the Hittites, you read about them in the Bible, they made a treaty with a bunch of other kingdoms that were trying to war against them. And it's like the first one we have and it's chiseled in stone. Right, which is kind of interesting because if you're having a signing ceremony, that's kind of hard. You got a guy out there with a chisel, you know. I'm not sure how you put your name on that, but you just, you know. But some of you, Denny, you could do it with a hammering thing. You did really good. So, um, then, then there's treaties that we might be a little bit more familiar with. There, there's two treaties of Paris. Didn't know if you knew that, and they're somewhat close in time. The first, uh, September 3rd, 1783 was the first uh, Treaty of Paris, which really put an actual end to the Revolutionary War. If you ever wondered, like, when did that actually end? It was when they signed it, but it was, it was in Paris, right? And, and the Britons in the, in the U.S. signed that treaty. Then, right after that, uh, for those of you who are real history buffs, uh, in 1815, there was the Treaty of Paris um, where Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, and then he signed that with all the other guys that he was warring against. 
Then there's another treaty, and France seems to get all the treaties, in Versailles, um, that ended World War I. Then, uh, September 2nd of 1945, uh, and, and that was actually the end of World War II. I, I know a lot of you think it might have been a little bit earlier in the year, but, because we had VE Day, right? But that was the end of the battling in Europe. But VJ Day, right? Uh, was when, the, uh, when it was signed uh, on the deck of the USS Missouri. And it's interesting because they didn't even call it a treaty. And I don't know if, if, if you've ever read much about this history, but there on the deck of the USS Missouri, um, there was a delegation from um, the Japanese Imperial Army and then General MacArthur, who was the Allied commander, and they all met on the deck of that, of that huge battleship. And... Um, and, and what they signed wasn't called a treaty. It, it was simply called the instrument of surrender. And, and that has a little bit to do with what we're going to talk about today. The instruments of surrender. You know, a, a treaty is, is kind of an agreement that spells out the two warring nations and how they're going to live together. This instrument of surrender is an unconditional surrender. It was just like, hey... It was completely, you had to completely surrender to the opposing party. And, and then they, they had all the say in what was going to happen after that. Now, tr- the book of Colossians here tries to help us understand how we can live at peace with God. You know, at the beginning, the first verse we read today, it says, once you were alienated from God and, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Uh, basically what happened, we were all alienated. It says we were enemies of God because of our behavior, right? The simple thoughts in our minds that turned to action, that turned to behavior. And so this sin separated us from God. And so we were God's enemies. Folks, we live in a broken, messed up world. I I know I didn't have to tell you that because some of you continue to watch the news as much as I keep telling you not to. So, no, um, no. It's, I mean, it, the world is filled with, with anxieties and fears and wars and, and death. This has been a very tough week, even for me personally. I've, I've got, um, starting last Monday, I have five memorial services in, in two weeks. And, and it's just been really difficult. Um, just just uh, yesterday, um, a dear brother of ours, Ken Allen, who sometimes would sit in our sound booth, um, went to be home with the Lord after a battle with pancreatic cancer. And what was crazy is while I'm doing one service, he passed into God's eternal glory. And I, my head was just spinning, and, and I thought, th- there's never been more evidence for me of the reality that, man, we, we need to take life and we need to take salvation seriously. Because our world is just a broken place and none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Now, when we're alienated from our Heavenly Father, nothing good ever ha- happens there. I mean, when, when we're alienated from God, right, when, when we're His enemies, we're left to fix it, we're left to figure it out on our own. And some of you know what life like that is all about, because you've been working really hard at that, trying to just figure it out on your own. Like, you're trying to fix it all. Remember, we talked about try- you're trying to hold it all together. You're trying to position yourself in a way that you think you can position yourself so that everything's going to work out okay. But without God, if you're alienated from him, if, if he's not your foundation, then I'm, I guarantee you that things will just continue to slip away. As soon as you think you've got one thing fixed, man, something else is just going to break. And, and, and you will go through this constant life of trying to fix things and hold it together yourself, and you just can't do it. We, this even happens in our homes. You know, being Father's Day, I thought I would, you know, give all of our dads here a, a challenge because we live in a, in a country that is really being devastated. A lot of, a lot of crazy stuff happening because, because dad's not in the home. 24 million children in the U.S. will go to bed tonight without dad in their home. And, and when that happens, when, when there's no father present, and I know that, that, that there's a lot of pain for some of you in the room because some of you have experienced that. 
And some of you worked really hard because of that, right, to, to work things out. But I'll tell you this, until you find your heavenly father, you, you'll just keep searching for answers. But when, when dad's not in the home, when we're, when we're alienated like that, it leads to all kinds of things. It, it leads to um, m- more children living in poverty, uh, more children being incarcerated, more children dropping out of school, um, especially young ladies uh, finding themselves um, pregnant before um, marriage. Um, all, kinds of, all kinds of crazy things happen that are stemmed from, research proves it, from not having dad in the home. And, and, and some of you dads, and, and I know because I'm preaching to myself here, some of you dads know that even when you live there, sometimes you're, you're really not there. Um, why? Because we put so much stake into, man, we, we've got to work it. We've got to hold it all together. We've got to make it all happen. And when we do that, you know, and I've got to provide all these things for my kids, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do this. And it just makes us crazy. And we're working hard, and we think we've kind of got it. But when your real presence isn't there, things will simply continue to fall apart. And so I just want to encourage you dads, dads, um, man, your, your kids, your home needs not only your physical, but they need your presence. They, they need your attention. They need your care. They need your love. Um, when we are alienated from God, we are his enemies. Um, we're, and it says that we're enemies in our minds. Uh, when our minds aren't right, our behavior will never be right. And life will be a mess. It'll be broken. It'll be empty. It'll be lost. But, but here's the good news. The good news, and, and we, we have this thing we, we talk about all the time, the gospel. The gospel is the good news. So the gospel is the good news. And, and so in verse 22, um, the apostle Paul shares, so, okay, you were an enemy. You were alienated from God. But guess what? There's good news. The good news is this. It says, but now. So you were once alienated. You once were an enemy of God. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Basically what he's saying here is this, is that God made a way, that while you were an enemy, God made a way, God kind of said, okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move in your direction. He moved first, moved in our direction to create peace with us. We weren't necessarily moving in his direction. He took it upon himself to move in our direction and said, hey, I'm going to create this peace treaty with you. He says, and and the way he did that was by Christ's physical body on the cross. In in 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, it says, for you know it was not with perishable things, the silver or gold, that you were redeemed. Okay, you can't buy it. Uh, From your empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Uh, Theologians call this the the great exchange. The great exchange that God made. That God treated Christ as we deserved, right? He, He died on the cross. He took our death so that he could treat us the way Christ deserved. Christ literally took our place on the cross. And and I love what it says in this verse. He redeemed us from an empty way of life. I was thinking about this this week. I, I, you know, we we live in an amazing place. I I was out, I got to go bike riding this week up in the hills, doing all kinds of fun stuff. And you're looking around going like, man, there just doesn't seem like there's anything wrong on the surface. But what's interesting is we will continue to try to fill our lives with all kinds of stuff because we just feel empty. And then we use up what we've got and then we go, wow, why is this empty some more? And some of you know because you've been trying every different thing to try to fill the void in your life. You've been trying to fill it with all kinds of stuff, sometimes with work, sometimes with pleasure, sometimes with, you know, you name it, you're trying to fill your life with it. Uh, Bas Pascal, a uh, theologian, said this, that all of us were created with a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And, and your soul will never be at rest until you find rest in God, until you fill it with him. And, and so God says, hey, there's good news that while you were an enemy, God made a way for you to live at peace with God. 
And then he continues on in verse 23. He says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm. We talked about the foundation part. So be firm and, and do not move from the hope that is held out in the gospel. This gospel that you heard and it has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. That was interesting. He says it's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. People ask me all the time, um, so does that mean like, you know, if, if, if animals and stuff here, the God, do, like do, do dogs go to heaven? And, and I always answer this, but I get myself in trouble. I always say, dogs, yes, cats, no. So, um, but... <laughs> No, please, no emails this week, okay? No emails, because that's just a joke. So if the dogs are going, the cats are probably going, but I don't know, you know? I'm not, I'm not gonna concern myself with that, right? But, but what, it, what it does tell us is this, is w- when we entered into sin and it damaged our relationship with God, it, the ripple effects actually reached out and damaged all of creation, See, that's, that's the piece a lot of times we don't really think about, that our sinfulness always has this ripple effect. Yeah, and, and, and it reaches out and it even touches our creation. And, and there's a verse in Romans that says, hey, all creation is waiting with groaning for the reconciliation of all things, right? Because the world is like, hey, why? Because when we get ourselves aligned with God and when we're living correctly, then we treat the people around us correctly. We even treat the world around us correctly. And, and the, wor- the world, the all creation takes a big sigh of relief. So it doesn't just impact us. And, and so all of creation benefits. Certainly when you come to Christ, the people around you benefit. So, one of the things that um, in studying this, I've studied this for years, is um, how, how do we create in our children a lifelong faith? How do we get them so where they're going to hold on to their faith when all the craziness of the world is, is circling around them? How are our kids going to have a lifelong faith? And they're really going to hold on to that for the rest of their lives. And they've done all these longitudinal studies about the things that it takes to make that happen. And I thought it was very interesting is um, that some of, the, some of the larger studies that have been done, the results say this, that oftentimes it's what mother believes and says about her faith, but it's what dad does. Isn't that interesting? It's what they hear from mom, but what they see from dad. And so on this Father's Day, dads, I I just want to throw it out and challenge you. You you know, that, that your wife, she's probably doing her part. She's talking it up, right? In fact, she's probably talking it up to you. In fact, she probably got you here this morning for some of you, right? You, you need to go. It's father, you know. And, but it's, it's what mom says, it's what dad does. And, and it's the actions that we live out in front of our kids. And man, they are watching. And all of you who are parents, you know how closely they're watching. And, and, and they're just little mirrors, Right? And they're just soaking it all in. And then they start saying things that you don't want them to say. And then you realize they're saying them because you said it. I mean, we had a great example in our family. We were driving down the road one day. And I'm just, I'm driving and somebody kind of cuts us off. And from the back seat, I hear this little teeny voice yell out, that person's an idiot. (laughs) I'm like, well, where did they get that, right? From dad. Right? They're just these little magnets. They just they suck it all in. Um, but the good news is, is that all creation benefits when we align ourselves with, with Christ. So our mission, Paul goes on to talk about like, okay, so we've got this good news, so then he puts us on a mission. In verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. There's some deep theological stuff we're not going to dive into completely there, but what he's saying is this. He says, look, I'm rejoicing that I'm suffering so that you guys can know the good news of the gospel. He says, it's worth it for me to suffer. Like, we remember Paul's in prison writing this. And he's saying, it's good for me to suffer because, because I'm suffering, 
you guys are getting are, are hearing the gospel. And he goes on in verse 25, he says, I have become its, that's the gospel servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. And that whole idea of commission um, is this idea that he has, basically we would say, a calling in his life. Um, but that word commission is, is really important because what it means is this. Uh, if you take the word apart, there's the little prefix that says co, right? Which means together. And then mission. We're together on a mission. And here's the thing, that all of us have a part. All of us have a part to play. A every single one of us, there's a, a calling on our lives and we need to do our part, the part that God calls us to do. And, and then, you know what? Stay in your lane. Let other people do the part that they're called to do. Paul knew his part. He was called to be uh, the, the, basically the proclaimer of the good news to the non-Jewish people, to the Gentiles, right? He's to, to go and take the gospel to where it had never been before. But every single one of us have a part to play. When, when, um, when I was growing up and, and playing, um, playing sports, I remember um, playing uh, football, and you'd go out and you'd play a game, and then during the week, you would have um, film day. And I always hated it, all right? I'd rather be out playing, but um, film day was bad because, you know, I, like, so I, I, I was oftentimes a lineman, and, and so we, we would watch a little segment of a play, and then the coach would hit stop, and then he'd look over there, and he'd go, all right, Lamont, what's your position? And I'm like, um, well, I, I'm, I'm defensive end. And he's like, what's your job? Containment. Did you contain? No. <laughs> right? And that's how film day goes, right? Because you're like, oh, man. And it's just like, he's like, oh, yeah, you, you, you tried to do somebody else's job. That's what I remember. He was like, you tried to do somebody else's job, or you, you know, right? And that's what happens oftentimes. But, but God has a calling for each one of us. And, and, and my encouragement to every single one of you is when you find that calling, it is, it is like your sweet spot. It, it is a place where you experience joy. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I'm experiencing joy because I'm doing what God has called me to do. And I'm seeing the fruit of that. And when you see the fruit of it, you can go, oh, yeah, this is good. The, the games that I got beat up the most because I was doing my job were really good games because we won. Because we won together. And, and the same thing happens today is God's calling you out. And one of the ways that we as a church, as a people who have good news to give to people, the way that we get that out to our community is when we all do our jobs. When, when we come, because you know what? We, we only have so many pastors on staff. We can only do so much. We, we need people to jump in and say, hey, I'm gonna help. We need, I don't know how many more volunteers for Vacation Bible School. And you know what? I, I know at times we say, oh, we'll, we'll just, it's almost like we'll take anybody. No, we want the person who God's calling. Because, man, they will make a difference there. Now, I will say, I'm not giving you an out, and you can't just go, well, I'm not being, you know, God's not calling me to that, okay? Because we still need people to do it. But, but I want to encourage you with this. Find the place. Find the place that God is calling you. And, and fit into that, and you will experience a unique joy that you've never felt before. I know some of you guys are moving through life and it just seems like, man, it's just drudgery, it's just hard, it's just all the time. And I would, I would say hey, this, man, where are the places, that, like, are you called to that? Or, or are you just filling up your time and your calendar with stuff because you think you gotta be busy? And I would say there is much more to life than that. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people who live to work and are miserable and I want to encourage you to figure out how, how are you going to work just so that you can live and live life to the fullest and get everything you should out of life. Um, he goes on in this passage and he talks about this mystery. And he says in, in verse 26, the mystery, this, so he's saying, hey, we're proclaiming this mystery that has been kept for ages and generations, but it's now being disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, 
God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The, the hope of glory, the hope of eternity is that Christ is formed in you. And, and what's interesting here is we talked last week about some of the crazy things that were going on in the city of Colossians, how the people were like trying to take from all these other gods and, and they, they had all these Roman gods and they tried to make Jesus just one of the other gods and the Christians were like, no, you can't just add Jesus to the whole list of other gods. There was another issue that was going on and that's um, this group called the Gnostics who were trying to, um, they were trying to give a different version of who Jesus was. They actually didn't believe that Jesus was human. They, they believed that Jesus was just like some spiritual being that kind of looked human. In fact, the ones, if you push them to the extreme, they don't even believe that um, when Jesus walked, they said he didn't leave footprints. Okay, they, they were kind of crazy, right? That be, and part of it was because they believed that all flesh was evil. And so Paul's combating this whole thing, and he's saying, no, it's not. And in fact, and this is a big deal for Paul to say to these people, Christ is in you. Because number one, these people who worship all these other gods would certainly think, well, if Jesus is God, he's out there somewhere, and he's just ready to punish us when we mess up. And, and God's out there somewhere because he's spirit, and we're flesh, and fl all flesh is bad, is what they would say. But Paul is saying, no, that's not the way this works. In fact, Jesus is God, and his Holy Spirit is living in you. He's, it's Christ in you. So not only do we live in Christ, but the thing we have to remember always is that, that he lives in us. He's living inside of us. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And so he continues on and, and he says this. And we'll, we'll kind of finish out with this, these last couple of verses in verse 28 and 29. He says, he is the one, this is Christ, who we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we might present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Most Bible scholars think that verse 28 is probably the key verse in this whole book. He says, he, or Christ, is the one we proclaim, admonishing, which means warning, and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we might present everyone fully mature in Christ. That word fully mature there, some of your Bibles it says perfect. Some of them say complete in Christ. It's a Greek word called telos. Telos is this word that means purpose. It, 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 it means this is what you were created for. Um, and oftentimes we get outside of the realm of what we were created for, right? When we live for ourselves, when we live just how we want to and not for the reason we were created without purpose, um, you know, that's, the Bible calls that sin, right? When we're living outside of the purpose that we were created for. Last week I was sharing with you how um, I'm really good at using things in ways that they're not created to be used. In fact, um, I, I took a picture of this last week. This is my, my screwdriver. It's, it's right here. I, I literally just pulled this out of my toolbox. Um, it is because I tried to use it like Denny used that hammer, right? I mean, I have, and what's crazy is I have about 30 of these, uh, and, and they are all beat to shreds because I'm really, really good at trying to use things for other than what they were created to be used for. And I, what I realize is this, when you do that, I mean, look at, I mean, that thing's totally bent, so it's been a pry bar. It's been a hammer. Um, I, I don't even know what else I did to this thing, but here's what I know is this, is all it did is did damage to this thing. I can't even, like, now I can't hardly use it right because it hurts to hold on to it. And it's been so messed up because it didn't get used the way it was supposed to. And, and, and here's what I would, I would contend this morning to this that there's many of us that have been living our lives this way. That, that we just have done what's convenient or what somebody told us, and we've just been, we've been living our life not the way it's been intended to live, be lived, 
but just the way that, you know, it was like, well, that was the first thing I grabbed, and so I just used it, right? And, and I think a lot of us end up living life like that. But what happens when we live life that way is that we end up looking like this. For a while, we might think, oh, we're okay, and you might think you're okay. Why? Because you think you kind of got that thing fixed. And what we realize, don't realize is this, is while you may have fixed this thing temporarily or short term or whatever, you may have got that fixed, but the damage sometimes that it takes on you because you aren't living life correctly, it, it takes a toll. And some of you know that's true because you, you, you know the pains and the sufferings and you feel it inside like, man, stuff is just taking a toll on me. I mean, I, I, I would say that we, we as a people, we as a nation, man, after the last couple of years, we look a lot like that. Because there's a lot of ways we, we didn't handle things maybe the way that we should have. We, we, we just, we just kind of went at things in ways that, that caused more damage than good. And, and so there's this idea in the Bible of, of telos, this becoming fully mature or perfect in Christ. And it, it, it runs kind of counterintuitive. There's, some of you know who Aristotle is. A Aristotle came up with this idea that... that um, there's something called poesis. Uh, poesis is basically action, okay, just action. Um, I, I'm, I'm always moving, always going, right? Sometimes I use the wrong tools and just do something, right? But action will have a result, but oftentimes poesis, because it's action that doesn't, isn't included in the telos or what the purpose is, because of that, the results can be random and often dangerous, in other words, it's just movement without thinking through it or, or understanding the purpose. And so when you do that, the results are crazy. The, the results are just kind of whatever you get. It's just kind of raw action. And, and I know because there's times in my life when I live that way. Why? Because most of us learn to just react. And when we just react, you never know what the result is going to be. There will be a result. I mean, something happens, there's going to be a result, something over here is going to happen, but you don't know what it is. But Aristotle, and I would say that some of the biblical scholars agreed with this, that there's another thing that's called praxis, and praxis is a little different. Praxis is action, but with the telos in mind. Praxis is this idea that you take action but you understand what the purpose of your life is. And then they would say, when, when you do that, then life is complete. I think some of you this morning, it's complete, it's it, perfect. It's tell, it, it, this word telos means that it's, it's the Hebrew word we talked about before sometimes called shalom. It means that everything is as it should be problem is a lot of times most of us are just running around so fast and we're trying to get things done that we don't take time to understand the purpose behind the things that we're doing in life or why we live the way that we live. And so we don't experience fullness and completeness and we're just off fixing the next thing. Why? Because we're just moving. I mean that whole idea of poesis is like you, you just don't know what result you're going to get. You're just doing something. But here it says, hey, Paul is saying, look, we want to teach everyone with all wisdom so that we can present everyone complete in Christ. Now, I, I don't know if it's been a while since maybe you felt like life is just complete. Like, like things are moving. It, it doesn't mean perfect. You know, it, does, it, it doesn't mean that, that there's no issues. It just means that Life is being lived the way it's designed to live. And there, like Paul said, he's in prison, but he can rejoice. Why? Because he's doing what he's designed to be doing. And so this morning, I, I, what, what I'd love to just let you know is this, that, that God not only wants to just save you, and he did that through the power of Christ on the cross, but he wants to give you life that's abundant and life that's complete and life that is free, 
like he said in the first verse, it's free from accusation, it's free from anxiety, it's free from pain and suffering and all these things. Why? Because he has a life of purpose for you. And if you haven't found that, then you're just gonna keep going. You'll just be part of the rat race. You know what the bad thing about the rat race is? Is that if you win, you're still a rat. Christ has a life for you that, like I said, is abundant, it's free, it's complete. And the question is, will, will you take that from him? Um, we were talking about treaties earlier. In, in the War of 1812, um, there was this battle, the Battle of New Orleans. Um, for you history buffs, you might remember this. Um, but the battle took place 18 days after the treaty for the war had been signed. So it was an unnecessary battle that was happening. Why? Because they didn't realize, because they didn't realize that the, the treaty had been signed, so all the people didn't surrender. And the bad thing about that was, is that for 18 days, that they lost about 100 people a day in that battle. So 1,800 people died because they didn't know that the treaty had already been signed. And folks, I, I'm not sure where you are this morning. Maybe you're still feeling alienated from God. Maybe you feel like you're God's enemy or maybe you feel like he's yours. But the question is, are, are you living out the plan and purpose that you were created to live? And, and do you want life to be complete, a life of purpose? And if so, quite simply, according to Paul, you need one thing. You need Jesus. Jesus will give you purpose. And Jesus will help you live a life that is complete. So if you've been wondering, what's the missing thing? It's Jesus. And when you put life under his direction, you'll experience joy, you'll experience freedom, you'll experience peace that you can't experience any other way. So I wanna encourage you today, take hold of Jesus. And dads today, I just wanna encourage you, Live it out in front of your kids. Because they might hear it, but they want to see it in your lives. And they want to put together that you are living a life of purpose. And when you do that, you will set your kid up for a life that is complete. Uh, we can do all this because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And so if you have your communion stuff with you this morning, we do this each week just to remind us of what Christ did for us. Um, this all happened. It wasn't an accident, but it was intentional on God's part that he came to save us from our sins. And like, uh, like Paul says in that first verse, he did that through Christ's physical body dying on the cross. And so we remember that every week. And so if you have the, the bread, let's remember Christ's broken body for us. Let's take that together. And the cup that represents his shed blood that forgives all our sins, like, let's take that together. My prayer today is that you will understand that you weren't created by mistake, that you weren't created, you know, randomly, that God has a great purpose for your life. And when you find that and you live with Christ at the center, when he is your foundation, life will be complete. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for the gift of Jesus that shows us how to live, that helps us to have life that is abundant and complete. Father, we thank you, God. I just want to pray for all the dads in the room this morning. That, Father, as we, as we busily work through life, as a lot of things come at us, that, Father, we will remember to be anchored in you, to make you our firm foundation. So that not only can we live in peace, but we can bring peace to our homes, to our children, and to the next generation that will proclaim Jesus as Lord. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name.